Brilliant. Thanks very much, Vince. And um, I also want to thank um, Jeff as well for the for the conference alongside Vince for getting us out of isolation at last to come and all talk about these amazing uh, projects together. And Danielle as well, who's been working behind the scenes, making sure it runs smoothly. So today I wanted to give you an introduction and update from the ACROSS project, another ERC funded project. Um, but this one's only a small one, it's the starting grant. And we're just hitting our stride with the project, or we were until lockdown. Um, so we're gonna continue with the global theme that started this morning and the beyond bit of this conference, because we're heading all the way across to Ireland, Southeast Asia and Australia. And as a project, it's important to say that ACROSS acknowledges the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the seas and lands on which we undertake our research. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. There we go. So I have my name on this talk, but like any big project, this really represents a whole team of researchers and colleagues. And it's important to say that this comes from not only here in the UK and at Southampton, but in uh, University of Huddersfield um, and with partners in Western Australia, the University of Western Australia and La Trobe University and the University de Minhau as well in Portugal. So thank you very much to all of them and for their input. And our data that we're going to be talking about today mainly comes from the Australian government and Geoscience Australia, which is an absolutely incredible resource. They have so much data available and I recommend anyone who's interested to go and have a look at it. Uh, but many thanks to them as well. So the ACROSS project is an ERC funded project studying some of the earliest seafaring in global history and trying to get to those big questions of human origins and think about our changing planet. So we're studying seafaring from Sunda, island Southeast Asia, to Sahul, which is modern day Australia and New Guinea. And we're looking in deep time. To do this, we need to understand the changing land and seascapes and the now submerged paleo landscapes um, in the region as well. And of course, this is much easier on the Australian shelf than it is in islands Southeast Asia because of the question of tectonics. So that is where we have started. Um, this approach combines multiple forms of ocean and earth science and archaeology, but also genetics as well. Um, so it really brings these different lines, different narratives and data sets together. And that's the main goal at the end. At the moment, they're still slightly disparate, but we're bringing, beginning to bring them together. And it also recognizes the importance of indigenous history and knowledge. And it's really important to say right from the offset that I'm an outsider being a European researcher. A West, I come from a Western scientific understanding of the world. And so for me, this research question includes the notion of trying to understand seafaring within a framework of global human migration. But I also accept, respect and acknowledge different ontologies, including many people's belief that they've always been on country. So whilst the chronology and the notion of arrival of people in Sahul is debated, the earliest date ranges from um, archaeological sites, suggest people were in Sahul by around 50,000 years ago, and maybe as early as 65,000 years ago or earlier. Now, different forms of knowledge and different ontologies can be difficult to bring together, to coalesce, but doing so brings this richness to the narratives that we can tell both about early seafaring and coastal activities and coastal change specifically for this project, but also more generally for ocean and earth science, sustainability and think about the human past. And it's worth saying that with the onset of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, running from 2021 to 2030, getting a quick plug in there, we highlight the need for the inclusion of these integrated interdisciplinary approaches to understanding human relationships with the sea and the importance of maritime and, un and underwater cultural heritage, which we know can be and is preserved within these submerged paleo landscapes on the continental shelf. And such paleo landscape research on the submerged shelf talks to multiple identified sustainable development goals or SDGs of the decade. So we have much work to do 
and potential as archaeologists to contribute greatly to this period. So what have we been doing so far as a project? Well, we've been researching changing landscapes and seascapes to understand both seafaring and life on the coast in deep time, running powerful ocean circulation models like NEMO, which are essential to global climate models, and understanding climate change through the glacial cycles from marine isotope stage six to about two, really, that's the period that we've been looking at. Alongside these ocean circulation models, we're mapping the paleo tides with changing uh, sea levels um, using Mike 21 and the changing geomorphology of the Paleo coast, um, putting that together to help inform us of the changing coastal environment and the changing ecozones. Ooh, but also of available resources and potential lived habitats. Okay, so we've been using the paleo drift models and examining maritime routing into the circle, playing with the models to include propulsion at various speeds and looking at windage and small crafts to study the effect of the changing monsoon and seasonality and water crossings. And here's an example of some of our latest work, which is looking at the fastest crossings throughout the regions. Now, what I'm going to do now is focus on this area here, because this is one of the ones of most interest, looking between Timor and um, the Australian shelf. So this is one of Birdsell's original routes, uh, southern routes into Australia. We've also been studying the rich oral traditions and indigenous narratives about early seafaring boats and changing coasts. And um, if you want to learn more about that, I would highly recommend looking at the project website, but I can't talk about that as well today. Um, OK, so really, the, the thing is to understand movement and seafaring between Sunda and Sahul in deep time, we need to first understand where those coasts were. And in case you're wondering, this is where the submerged landscapes and the lost frontiers part of this research comes in. A big part of this project involves using offshore industry data and 2D and 3D seismic analysis to understand the changing nature of the now submerged coastal uh, landscape to better understand sea level change, to locate the paleo coast, and in order to help us interpret changing features and changing environments. And this is what I really want to focus on today. Now, I think this might move if I click on it. No, it won't because it's a pointer. So let me just get rid of the laser pointer. Okay, so to understand this really early and important maritime activity, we need to understand what the landscape was like and what the seascape was like. And so we need to take this multidisciplinary approach. And as you can see, it's really about this changing dynamic land and say, seascape. Ooh. So we're nearing halfway on this project and I'm going to show you just a few of the data sets we've been working on. We initially started concentrating on the Bonaparte Gulf, which is um, this region here. You can see it on the tiny inset. Um, it looks like a small kind of gulf, but it's absolutely huge. Um, but we've also started spreading around the coast, looking at this section here, uh, the Arafura Sea and the Gulf of Carpentaria. And we've been looking at the data and accessing the data in the last few weeks and putting that together. So we'll have to wait for another um, seminar to show that work. Um, but the Bonaparte Gulf is perhaps the first place to start. Um, it's, it's absolutely full of data, so it's a great place to start looking. And, um, you know, the, the thing is that I'm particularly interested in around the time frame of 71 to 59,000 years ago. So marine isotope stage four, which coincides with the earliest dated archaeology uh, potentially as old as 65,000 ago, which is Madja Baby, which you can read about in the Clarkson et al. 2019 paper. But why start with Bonaparte Gulf? Okay, so it's probably as close as possible to that earliest site, but also because 
it's if you're interested in the Birdsell's roots, which I showed you a second ago into Sahul, this is one of the most important routes as part of a crossing from Timor or Rote on the center shelf into Sahul itself. But my interest in this region from a paleo landscape perspective was also formed after discussions with Nick Fleming about the Sirius expedition at a splash cost conference in Brisbane many years ago now, where, and I hope he won't mind me retelling this uh, because he'll probably do it much better at another point, but he said to me that Rhys Jones commented that if Nick could remove the water, he'd find him an early site. In 1982, when Nick Fleming and his team explored the submerged quaternary landscape of the Kutamundra Shoals, which is up here, um, just northwest of Darwin, 240 kilometers northwest of Darwin. Uh, this was one of the first surveys of a submerged quaternary landscape in Australasia to recognize the cultural importance of these offshore landscapes, both for understanding movement into Sahul in deep time, but also the changing coastal environment and the potential for preserved archaeology on the submerged shelf. So here we are nearly 40 years on, survey methods have developed a pace and wider research into submerged landscapes around Australasia is developing momentum. With underwater finds by the Deep History of Sea Country project that Jonathan Benjamin is going to be talking about later this morning and actually showing that archaeology can be preserved and can be found. And the available data is somewhat different from the early 80s. Another reason for choosing this region, and luckily for us, there's been lots and lots of offshore industry in this region. So we're understanding an integrated, and we're, so we're, sorry, we're undertaking an integrated interpretive study of the evolving submerged landscapes to the late Pleistocene of the North Australian shelf using oil and gas industry 2D and 3D seismic data, together with some core borehole data to determine lowest, low stand paleo environments and shoreline positions over the last glacial period from MIS-1 to about 5E, but with a focus on the low stand of MIS-4. These are the data sets we've analysed so far in this region, with thanks to Geoscience Australia and Anthony Fogg and Justin Dix. And we have 16 3D data sets, high-res 2D data and hundreds of 2D lines to stitch them together. And this is a big country, as you know, so big data is also required and an approach of trying to get this question of scale. It's something that came up again and again yesterday. Uh, but just to give you a, an indication of the size of the Gulf, of uh, the Bonaparte Gulf, I just stuck the British, or some of the British Isles in there, and you could just really get a sense of, of the scale of this. Okay, back to the data itself. So we have lots of data, but not enough cores, which is generally always the problem. And this was highlight, highlighted just a, a moment ago as well. And this certainly is going to be the next challenge and the next big project in this region. And it's worth doing and it's worth funding. Um, but we do have a series of cores and dates that we've recently recalibrated with big thanks to Michael Grant. And they help provide a boundary um, or boundary data to calibrate the seismics and to interpret sedimentation rates. It's also helped us to pin down our sea level curves. The issue with using this industry data, as you all know, though, is that we're only really interested within with the top uh, few seconds. And this wasn't collected for archaeologists or people interested in late quaternary paleo landscape study. So it's taken a lot of seismic processing. And if you want to hear more about this, I would definitely put you in touch with Anthony Fogg, who did this uh, work for us. And he'll happily discuss the merits of inverse Q and various other stages of processing. Uh, one aspect of this research has been the application of new methods, especially in near surface seismic data analysis and interpretation, which will feed back into industry and marine science. But what it has enabled is an extensive 2D and 3D seismic reflection database to be created for the Northwest Australian shelf, centering on the Bonaparte Gulf using publicly available archives. Interpretation of the seismic data is constrained by data stratigraphy in shallow cores with lower bounds determined from oil and gas well bores. And we can then reference this against relative sea levels to identify subaqueous or subaerial position. 
So marine isotope stages one to six are identified within the top about 90 meters of events below the seabed. High resolution 2D lines are available in the Petrel subbasin, and these lines have proved key to understanding the geomorphology over the past 125,000 years, as they allow high stands, those are the thin parallel, the thin parallel low energy environment seismic reflection lines, and the low stands, which are the incised chaotic and intra-channel onlapping seismic reflection vents. Um, so it allows these periods to be interpreted. It's possible to interpret high stands associated with MIS-1, MIS-3 and MIS-5, and low stands for MIS-2 and MIS-4. Okay, so what you're looking at here are the MIS-4 map sediment locations with the 80 meter contour um, outlined in pink. It's um, so hard to see, I'm sorry about that. It's very, very fine line. So if we focus in on the MIS-4, we have a geomorphological interpretation of an evolving coastal and fluvial emergent landscape. We have correspondence to the present day 80 meter bathymetric contour plus minus three meters. And tidal signatures are observed in the stratigraphy that are consistent with the present day 84 meter and 80 meter bathymetric contours. And this is brilliant because this fits really nicely with the models produced um, earlier in the project by Kaye et al on the paleo tides for this period in this region. We also have potential peak emergent land heights, including, oh, now I do need the pointer, um, including here, the uh, Londonderry High, this, this bit here of uh, around 20 meters, the Suhul platform along here of 70 meters, and the Van Diemen rise of around 30 meters. And contemporaneous depos depositional environments, are identified as reef um, along here, and you can see them in here. Um, we've also got beaches, estuarine deposits, lagoonal and fluvial faces associated with the MIS-4 low stand. The spatial location of these environments is controlled primarily by relative sea level, but and secondary controls the subaerial erosion due to ablation, wave erosion and precipitation. Moving south into the Gulf, and um, you can see, ooh, yeah, you see here, into this area here, we see dramatically changing landscape, fluvial systems, uh, major drainages, several kilometers across estuarine and intertidal features. So what we're looking at here are the impedance slices for the Petrel 3D in the Bonaparte Gulf. Um, so what you can see at the bottom here is high energy transport fluvial followed by low energy transport fluvial grading to the northwest to estuarine conditions. Um, then we don't have the MIS-5 identified, possibly this is a period of non-deposition. Um, then we have MIS-4, which is fully estuarine. Um, and we've got sort of submerged area with hinterland uh, supply of fluvial sediments from the southeast. Uh, we also have the diffuse features, which we are interpreting it as indicating potential lagoonal environments. Um, and then MIS-2 to MIS-1, again, the MIS-3 is not identified. Um, but what we're seeing in MIS-2 is high energy transport fluvial followed by low energy um, transport fluvial, and then MIS-1, the transgression to create a fully open marine environment. So where does this lead us? Well, as archaeologists, we're really interested in what this means in terms of the paleo landscape and potential areas for preservation and understanding coastal activity, for example, seafaring, and also coastal ecology. But quaternary seismic specialists are often very wary about doing this sort of image, um, this sort of reconstruction. So I stress that this very much is an interpretation to give us some idea of what is going on. Um, 
And it's depicting a proposed schematic representation of the MIS4 landscape for the greater Bonaparte Gulf, associated with the peak or dominant low stand of around 80 metres plus min minus three uh, metres relative sea level that has been interpreted in the present study. A broad barrier to the northwest formed by the subaerially exposed Sahul platform forms an extensive region of islands, inlets and channels, which border lag a lagoon to the southeast of around approximately 40,000 kilometres square. The lagoon is connected to the broader shelf and the open sea via numerous seaways and a significant deep channel called the Melita Gra Graben to the north. There is potential for the development of extensive saltwater or brackish marsh area to the southwest and southeast of the lagoon, and microtidal estuary is present on the eastern paleo coastline, where fluvial channels provide plastic input. The margins of the lagoon are shallow enough for the development of isolated pinnacle carbonate reefs flanked by estuary sediments. On exposed carbonate surfaces, classification has developed associated with wave cut platforms and higher ground. And it's really interesting thinking about that in terms of perhaps active landscapes. Moving further inland from the estuary, the landscape changes from brackish to freshwater marsh, and where the land is more elevated, or surface drainage has improved, this grades to open grassland with possible shrub and tree development. Beyond the lagoon, there is a broad fringing shelf bordered by an archipelago of islands from the southwest to the northeast beyond the shelf edge. Isolated reef carbonate growth associated with the regeneration of the older platforms that were once there may be observed. To the west of the area of Londonderry High, which is this area here, forms a disconnected sorry, uh, we see a disconnected peninsula with occasional beaches forming in coves on the southern aspect down here. Development of tidal mudflats is observed on the northern aspects of a headland to the south of the Londonderry High, just here. And the deep, wa and deep water currents in this area are evidenced by the development, oh sorry, um, development of current modified bedrooms and contourites, which we're seeing in here as well. So uh, think about present day analogues, much like Carol earlier, it's one way to help visualize and understand these environments. So think about how they might have been today. And this is just a first step in understanding the changing nature of the coastal environment. We can see where the sediments are preserved across the Gulf And through this, um, that we might see preserved in these environments. A uh, future step could be identifying the best areas for, for further coring and study. Uh, it's outside of the scope of this project at the moment, uh, but at the same time, it raises many questions about how to achieve this work. So not only has the technology, technology come on a long way in the last 40 years since the Kutamundra project, but so has the awareness of the need to take a community-led approach to this sort of future work, if these potential underwater sites are to be located and protected. Uh, so this sort of large survey project crosses multiple communities, states and countries' waters. It creates a challenge for how we do this kind of paleo landscape work at this scale in the future. So the recently formed Splosh Network funded by INQUA has been created to discuss these specific challenges to the multitude of submerged landscape projects that are currently taking place in the Southern Hemisphere. And we hope that this is gonna help grow the discipline and drive research and publication in this region. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know Jeff has already turned on the camera, so I'm sure my time is up. <laughs> Well, indeed, and uh, Vince Gaffney was supposed to be chairing, but he seems to have locked himself out of the um, uh, of the the internet. Um, so oh. I'm stepping in uh, to read out any questions that uh, appear in the chat box. Um, right, here we go. Uh, one question from Robin Allaby: uh, Could you elaborate a bit on the goals for the archaeogenetic work, please? Um, absolutely, I can. Yes. So I didn't talk about it today because partly because of the themes of what we um, what we were talking about as the main conference. 
But the idea is that we're looking at um, looking at modern communities and we're looking at movement through the islands and uh, through mtDNA and Y chromosome and also um, whole genome as well. And that's to look at the distribution of different lines and to try and see if there is a geographic um, a geographic pattern within that that might say something about where people travel to and from. And of course, so I'm not an archaeogeneticist. This is one of the working groups on the project, which is led by Professor Martin Richards at University of Huddersfield. So it's, um, it, it's ongoing at the moment. And um, yeah, you'll see there's lots and lots of work at the moment looking at um, population genetics. Of course, it's, um, it, it's one of those areas which is uh, constantly tied to thinking about distribution of people and, and looking at movement through um, paleo geography. So it, it's yet another data strand that we're using to start thinking about movement in the region.